Topping Talks. Hundred and five hours a week, can't be beat. Welcome to Topping Talks. Topping Talks is a Topping Tribune production, and today's episode is probably sponsored by Topping Technologies and ExpressVPN. Topping Talks is also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all your favorite platforms. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see their founder at least twice a day. I gotta say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, you see, that's the joke. If you're an IT leader or a business owner here, you can reach out to the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Also, are you part of the 3.6% of Americans who still care about your privacy? If you are, then perfect. ExpressVPN can assist. Even though 96% of the stats are made up on the spot, ExpressVPN does give 100% guarantee via the 30-day back money guarantee. Now, without further ado, I am proud today to say that I'm interviewing Paul Donahue, who is a former global account manager at Pure Storage. How are you doing, Nick? Absolutely. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So winding back the clock quite a couple of years. How did you first get yeah. into IT? <laughs> Decades back in the day. Uh, you know, right out of college, I got a job working for uh, Anaconda Wire and Cable. They were a provider of phone cables really? and telephone line cables, the mm-hmm. ones that go underground and on the towers, yeah. uh, to the old Bell telephone system. Well, after, right after they broke up, when they divested AT&T and all the regional Bell companies, they all had to buy their own stuff, right? They couldn't buy from Bell Labs anymore. Oh, wow. And uh, that was my first exposure to, you know, technology, really, mm-hmm. you know, going to school and stuff like that. Back in the day, we didn't have, you know, IBM Selectric typewriters were yeah. state-of-the-art at the time. <laughs> I did that for a couple of years, and then a friend of mine started a, uh, a Microsoft PC DOS software company. Oh, really? And we took a product to market called Smart, which was basically uh, Microsoft Office for DOS. Um, really? And, yeah, it was all built on, you know, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, moved to three and a half inch floppy disks. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah, <laughs> moved fast. I did that for two years, and uh, then another buddy of mine went over to a hardware company mm-hmm. and said, hey, you should see what we're doing over here with, with uh, personal computers. Oh, yeah? Uh, you know, at that time, they were the size of, you know, uh, an engine block. Oh, you know? oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and just as heavy, too. And just as heavy. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Tallgrass Technologies was the name of that company. They're still in business as an IT reseller. Really? Uh, at that day, they were a, a manufacturer of both... Um, networking hardware, Banyan Binds Networking, which you probably never no, heard of. No, what's, what's that? <laughs> it was one of the precursors to, uh, it was Novell and Banyan were the two major networking companies back in the day. I, I know, I've heard of Novell. I had a couple yeah. of friends who work at or come from there throughout the years. But Yeah, it was based on the Banyan tree, right? Th- multi-threaded yeah. uh, processing and stuff. And that was kind of cool. And we also sold the first uh, backup system, hardware backup system, for the IBM PC. Oh, really? We bought refurbished IBM PC cases, had them repainted, yeah. and we mounted a 5 gig gig <laughs> hard drive and a 10 gig uh, back, tape backup system. Really? It's a yeah. hybrid back then. It was day. a hybrid. So five gigs. That's a lot of it data was, back it was, then. At that time, I mean, it was more than anybody thought they needed. Yeah, who would have thought yeah. we'd ever need more than five gig of backup data? Yeah, you know, today's... You know, I mean, uh, a terabyte's nothing. Oh, yeah? Right? You got a terabyte in your phone, right? Peta- I mean, petabytes I'm... are the kind of the baseline for scalability today, going up uh, to exabytes and a lot of bytes and all that other stuff. Oh, it's crazy. I mean, an average interview on the show is 756 gigabytes raw. Yeah. Before you actually render the video, it's mm-hmm. astonishing how much data we produce these days. It... Well, if you look at it, right, information technology, what's well, information? It's data. Yep. Right? Data has gravity, it persists. Right? Absolutely. Nobody wants to get rid of anything. We're all no. <laughs> technology hoarders. <laughs> yeah. You know. Uh, so I've I've uh, I've made a good living over the last you know forty years selling data, yeah. data storage, data management, data portability, data management, data analytics. You know, it, it, everything is based on the intellectual property that we create, Very and true. we create more and more every day. Absolutely. And every company's a tech company. They just don't know it yet. That's why I always tell people. <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, think about it. You know, they use data for marketing. They use data yeah. for sales analysis. Right. Oh, yeah. Plus, 
where do I put the next store? Where do I, what's mm. the next flavor? Oh, it's dependent upon the customers and their yeah. feedback. What's, well, that's all data. What's right? the customer profile? What, what are the odds that they're going to like this new product if they already like XYZ products in the past or yeah. they purchased them before? And, you know, data is um, worthless without the analytics to it. True. You know, you, it's just a bunch of bytes, right? Exactly. Ones and zeros. It's what you do with it. Very and, true. And, you know, we make mistakes, we adjust, we move forward. Right? Absolutely. So. Then where do you go from after that company? Uh, well, I went from uh, from that to a company called Exabyte, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Exabyte was another tape manufacturer, tape drive manufacturer. Uh, we used to have an assembly line in Boulder, Colorado. Really? It took, we bought Sony uh, camcorder. Yeah mechanisms mm -hmm. and we stripped the case off of them yeah right we recycled the cases mm -hmm. and we took that tape drive mechanism the eight millimeter tape drive mechanism and we shoved it in a different box and <laughs> that was what we used for tape backup there and, you go you know we started off with one in a box mm -hmm. and you put two in a box and somebody got really smart and came over from storage tech which is another leader in you know robotic tape technology mm -hmm. and said hey let's build something that you know has movable parts and we move arms up and down and take tapes out of a carousel and, yeah you know you've seen them in movies oh, tape libraries yeah yeah tape libraries right you take a tape out you shove it back in the drive yeah. when you read that one and you put the new one in and mm -hmm. you know they just kept getting uh, you know larger and larger as people had more and more data how much data were store. those first machines backing up I think they were like 30 or 60 gig, you know. I remember when we did, this is a terabyte library. Yeah. You know, had 640 tapes in it. Oh, my gosh, in a really? Big carousel. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. Wow. It's astonishing the engineering they have at Sony. Every year they somehow find out how to make, have put more data on those LTO more tapes. Data on the, yeah. I mean, you know, tape technology has been around for, I don't know, 60 years. Yeah. And they're still selling. That was durable. You know, it's, it's great durable. ROI. The, the problem is, right, with, uh, with backup, and mm -hmm. especially on tape, because you've yeah. got a movable magnetic medium, mm -hmm. right? You can guarantee that you write to it. Yes. You can never guarantee that you can read it back. Well, that's not a great question <laughs> to ask clients. Like, you have, you have backups? Yes, we do. Excellent. When did you test them? That's yeah. always the big million-dollar question. How like, often do you test them, yeah. right? What's your success ratio? Yes. And what else are you going to do? What's the next thing? Exactly. Right? I mean, we, we live through optical disk. Oh, yeah. You know, we lived through spinning disc, right? Mm -hmm. Or what we used to call at, uh, at Pure before I left, right? Spinning rust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and all the digital stuff. Now they're talking about holographic. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, some... Glad. Maybe, maybe I'll see that. Yeah, you know? I remember IBM was a 12, 12, 24 months ago. They were talking about experimenting with engraving on pieces of glass. Yeah. Like a sci-fi oh, movie. Yeah. Well, right now, you know, the the leading technology in storage is obviously all flash. Yeah, right. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's static. Fast. It's fast. Oh yeah. You know, it's it's getting more dense, right? Mm -hmm. So you can put more and more data in the same space oh, yeah. with less power, which oh, yeah. you know, the inverse of where you think things are going to go. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, now you can get a petabyte, you know, in the same footprint that you can get like a four U super. Exactly. You know, so. Uh, the densities are great. The power consumption is great. You get a, a whole lot of benefits from that. So it's fun to watch the the migration. Absolutely, yeah. it's even more impressive when the cost goes down too. Like even just even on a small consumer level, like I, even for the show when I buy like in a couple SSDs for the drives here, I remember yeah. now the price of a two terabyte is the same as what it was for a one terabyte like twelve or 20, thirteen months ago. Yeah, it just keeps going down. Yeah. <laughs> and you know SSDs are are. A good commercial product. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right? You know, uh, for for enterprise use, right? You want to get more. You want to get closer to the RAM as you can, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and and take advantages of the scalability of that stuff. So it's been a fun progression. And you know, technology drives a lot, but the market drives everything. Very true. Right? If the customer doesn't have a need, mm -hmm. you know, we built lots of great products over yeah. the years that have failed miserably. The oh, Betamax. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. That's a, <laughs> debate. that's a debate in and of itself of why it failed, though. Sony losing that format war, but then ironically winning the Blu-ray war. But then nobody cared. Nobody cared. Right? Only diehard movie enthusiasts want Blu-ray. <laughs> something else comes out, right? I mean, exactly. you look at the correlation. You know, you look at Netflix versus Blockbuster. Yeah. Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix. For $50 million. For $50 million. <laughs> and they and laughed the founder at said, there's no future in that. 
Oh, yeah. Right? There's one blockbuster left in the entire world. And it's now been converted to an Airbnb because they could not make it <laughs> renting the actual yeah. media. But they can't buy it anymore. No. <laughs> you know? Uh, so, yeah, so that's fun. It's a, it's an ever-changing market. And, you know, it all comes down to the customer. Absolutely. The client. What do you want? What do you want to achieve? Right? Mm-hmm. We went from being product-based salespeople, you know, probably... I don't know, 15, 20 years ago Mm -hmm. to start thinking about solution based selling. Well, what is the solution? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a combination of products that you build to provide an outcome for the customer. Exactly. You know, and now outcomes are are really the main focus. Right. It's Mm -hmm. evolutionary changes, but nobody cares what is in the box. They're not buying the box. Right. What does the box do for me? Exactly. You know, um, how do I how do I achieve monetization of my data? How do I get faster customer results? How do I turn my reports over faster? Yep. Whatever their need is, you got to figure out a way to address that question Absolutely. Right? and provide them a comprehensive solution. You can't just say, well, if you buy my part and then you buy this part and then mm-hmm. you have a hire guy to yep. figure out how to put them together, that doesn't work anymore. No. You know, there's not enough time. There's not enough knowledge. There's not enough people, no. you know, to, to make that effective and, and efficient. Yep. So uh, that's kind of the fun transition, you know, over my career, selling boxes, right, to selling mm-hmm. products and building solutions that made sense, you know, robotic libraries, oh, yeah. right, that addressed the fact that you didn't have to have a human being standing there and 24 yeah. hours a day, <laughs> right? Oh, that one's full, put in the new one, yep. you know? And what happens? Oh, I dropped it. Oh, yeah. Or the, the human error. I mislabeled it. Or I can't. Or I dropped it. I forgot. I, I forgot. I'd go get coffee. I had to go to the bathroom. Exactly. You precisely. Know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's uh, that's part of the the, the progression, mm. you know, and uh, it's continuing today. Absolutely. Now, where do you go from there? So you start off backing up five gigs and you're up to 30 gigs. We got up to, well, you know, our goal was mm-hmm. to actually produce an exabyte level product oh really right which yeah. was i think it's what 1200 uh terabytes mm-hmm. right and then you, you move up to you know oh you gotta have a petabyte and you take mm-hmm. oh a thousand petabytes and you take oh there's another one a lot of byte or something yeah. like that and, you know they, they come up with up some up. great names for oh, yeah. it you know uh we used to have a joke you know uh what the heck is an exabyte yeah you know and we had little chattering teeth mm-hmm. that said that, that's an exabyte right <laughs> 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 nibbling away at your data yeah i like that you know um I then went back into the software business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I went to work for a company uh, based in the UK called KVS. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, KVS was an archive software product. So you have a backup. Mm-hmm. That's great. You need backups daily, weekly, monthly, you know, annually. Yeah. What do you do for long-term storage? Mm-hmm. Well, that's when the concept of archiving came in, yep. right? So you can either archive to disk, you can archive to tape. But the concept was we did it so that you have longer term, mm-hmm. right? Some industries, thanks God for regulation. And oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> they ha- you have to have the data for X amount of time. Yep. You know, at various industries say you have to keep it, you know, until your patient reaches maturity, right? Yep. And seven years after that. Or you've got to keep this data forever. Yeah. You know, seven, ten years seems to be a pretty decent number, but... I mean, that's what they Somebody tell. Somebody made it up. You oh, know? Yeah. Well, the government mandates, because I know like for businesses, you have to have receipts for like seven years. Seven years, right. Taxation, stuff like Precisely. that. Precisely. You know? um, and, uh, you know, it was kind of the right move at the right time. Archiving was starting to really get popular. Mm-hmm. And they passed a bunch of laws that said financial institutions have to keep data for this long. Mm-hmm. They weren't doing that. And more importantly, not only do you have to keep it, you have to be able to provide it on demand oh, geez. if we want access to it. Now, there were some restrictions, and this was way mm. before personal information you know, restrictions and things came out. But the financial industry was especially heart, uh, heavy into this regulation called Sarbanes-Oxley. Oh, yeah. Right? Sox made sure that financial institutions not only saved the data, Mm -hmm. but had a methodology. If they got a subpoena, Mm -hmm. like a bunch of them did, Oh yeah, right? Uh, There was a guy named Elliot Spitzer, who was the attorney general in New York City. And he sued all of the big financial services companies for improper business practices. And he said, I want to see all your emails. Mm -hmm. I want to see all your digital transactions. Yeah. Phone calls, text, Mm -hmm. you know, Bloomberg terminal transactions, which was really a text based messaging platform mm-hmm. right and email well, how do you how do you pull your email mm-hmm. out of the millions of emails 
that somebody like Merrill Lynch was saving. Yeah. Right? And deliver them to a third party in a manner they could read them and use them in a trial. And KBS had a software package that could do that. So it's basically, it created, a, a, it created a separate index mm. of all that data. We read the metadata, right? We, I mean, it was really, really, really a, way ahead of its game. Yeah. And, but we needed a hardware platform that could support it. Mm. So we partnered with uh, EMC Corporation. Oh, nice. The evil machine company, as it was <laughs> known in those days, right? Because they were monolith, right? They started off as an IBM oh, yeah. uh, o OEM, right? They were yeah. selling memory cards yeah. for IBM machines. And they got into the storage business. Mm. And they had a particular platform that was an archive platform. Mm. And they came out with a hardware platform. We had a software platform. It was a marriage made in the channel. That's perfect. You know? Yeah. And we, uh, we got very, very, very lucky that, mm. you know, they had an extensive sales force. They needed software to drive that platform. Mm. They partnered with us. And it was, uh, it was a feeding frenzy yeah. for about three years. Right? We couldn't sell the software fast enough. We couldn't install it fast enough. Really? And I think we had, I don't know, maybe 150 employees worldwide. Oh, wow. You know, it took um, anywhere between like three days and a week to get the software installed with the hardware. Right. Yeah. Then we could start ingesting the data, mm -hmm. right, to provide it to companies. And they're like, look, every day we don't deliver, mm -hmm. it's a $100,000 fine. 100K? 100K. This oh was back God. in the, you know, in the, 90s. So that's like a million dollars now. Yeah. Spitzer <laughs> yeah, was inflation. crazy. Spitzer was crazy. Yeah. Right? But what are you going to do? The United States government, right? And the government of New York is suing you Jeez. and holding you accountable for delivering this data. Yeah. And man, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Right? Absolutely. It was just crazy. We were working 14, 16 hours a day. Oh, my God. You know, flying across country. Yeah. You know, one call closes with a customer. No. Like they need it, right? I have to have this. Yeah. Right? Who's One. your competition? Well, this guy, but he doesn't do this. This guy doesn't do that. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is you're the only guy that can meet this. I'm like, yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know? So but Did so, you really have one call sale, sales calls? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. One call sales calls. Yeah. For, we, would, we would call them. Oh. Like, can you see a demo? I'm like, sure. Yeah. Here. Right? And we'd wire them in and we'd show mm -hmm. them, you know, a live demo, you know, across the internet at that time was very, mm -hmm. very basic. Yeah. You know? Um, and they say, can you, can you, we have... You know, we had customer references. We had mm. people they knew oh, that they could call yeah. and go, yes, I bought it. It works. Mm -hmm. There you go. Get the PO. Get a PO. Oh, my gosh. Get you scheduled for installation, right? Yeah. Get with the MC. You got to buy the box. Of course. You know, yeah. and uh, one thing led to another. And the guy that I was mainly paired with at EMC mm. was running their archive group. Mm. And he's like, why don't you come to work for us? Yeah. Because my guys don't know how to sell this. And mm -hmm. you do. Yeah. So, you know, come over here. I'll pay you more money. There you right? go. And it's a bigger company. You got more yeah. benefits. And, you know, I was like, yeah, cool. That's fun. So uh, see, I went to EMC and uh, spent a decade there. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. How do you like it? Um, it was a blast. I mean, mm -hmm. I had a lot of fun for nine years. The last year, not so much. Oh, really? You know, uh, they went on a buying spree. They got really large. They started making massive acquisitions, right? Mm -hmm. They were trying to consolidate the storage market under under the EMC umbrella. Yeah. And they bought competitive products. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, why aren't you selling this? I was like, well, because I've been selling this. Yeah. It does the same thing. Yeah. And customers understand this one. They don't mm -hmm. really understand this one. Yeah. It was a weird combination of hardware, software, services. Um, but it was, a, it was a great ride, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, met some really great people. You know, pe mm -hmm. my best friend. You know, worked with me at KVS, worked with me at EMC. There you go. He worked with me at Pure. There you go. You I know. see a trend. <laughs> so, you know, we just, we, we, uh, we just continued, yeah. you know, the ride. And uh, left EMC, went to a software company, a backup software company that was actually migrating. And I guess they were expanding their offering, mm -hmm. right? It was not just backup or archive. They combined mm -hmm. that into a real data management platform. So the ability to move data where you need it, when you needed it, in whatever format yeah. you needed it. You need it for long-term retention, that's great, but I can slice and dice that and give it to you for production, I can give it to you for backup, I can give it mm -hmm. to you for 
well, a new term, business continuity. Oh, yeah. Right? Because backup's boring, so. True. <laughs> what sounds better than backup? Oh, yeah. continuity. That oh. sounds fancy. Marketing's it important. Was, <laughs> well, you can charge more money for continuity. All right, there you go. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. So uh, I did that for about five years. And then uh, a good friend of mine that I'd known at EMC uh, said, hey, this is the next big thing in storage, mm -hmm. right? You got your spinning disk and that's going to last for a while. Oh, yeah. You got these things called SSDs that are basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're writing the same protocols yeah. as disk drives. We're just doing it on flash memory, but we treat yeah. it the same. Yeah. So it's easy. Okay. But Pure has a different idea. What if we mm -hmm. started from scratch yeah. and said, no, it's not a spinning disk. Mm -hmm. There's no rotational media, yeah. right? It's just bits and bytes. Right, mm -hmm. we're writing ones and zeros to the fastest medium available, mm -hmm. which was raw NAND. Right? Yeah. Just you know, take all the the processing out of it, put a separate processor in it. Yeah. Just write the data to flash medium. Mm -hmm. And here's our roadmap. I'm like, I don't know. It sounds mm -hmm. interesting, but it sounds really, really fragile at yeah. this point. A year later, he called me back and said, okay, look, we're getting really serious now. Yeah. I'm like, okay, what do you got? And he's like, we're in the second generation of our product already. Yeah. Okay. And he's, we had you know, two or three years of stealth mode. Mm -hmm. Why don't you come over? We're, we need to know the channel you're working with, yeah. right? The go-to-market, route-to-market vehicles that you work with. Mm -hmm. And I had transitioned from selling direct to selling through partners yep. like you yourself, go. right? Value-added resellers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, channel partners to uh, a new class that was evolving, which was actually a throwback to the early days of like EDS. Oh, yeah. right? Remember EDS? They oh, took yeah. a mainframe and they sliced and diced it. They partitioned it. Yep. They said, you can buy it by the hour, yeah. right? Because you don't need it 24 hours a day. Precisely. You can buy it by the hour. Well, a whole industry sprung up mm -hmm. doing that called service providers. Yeah. Right? Service delivery partners, managed service MSPs, providers, yep, yep. right? Lots of different uh, nomenclature for it and then acronyms. Yeah. But basically, you know, uh, they consolidate the products mm -hmm. and they offer to you to meet your outcomes mm -hmm. as a service, mm -hmm. right? What a great concept. And we took that for the last six years or so and, and built a really nice business, built mm -hmm. a really uh, robust, productive, very profitable business oh, yeah. um because a lot of companies can't afford to buy a, f a full flash array that they'll only use a little bit it makes well, sense just get a fraction of it or just get, get it a as fraction a service. Of it. right yep. and and a lot of companies you know they over time people have said i don't want to be in the data center business oh right? yeah that pendulum I'm, I'm in the tennis shoe business or i'm in yep. the ice cream business or yep. i'm in some I'm, what, whatever yeah my core competency is not building and managing data centers there's yep. people who do that let them go do that let them go build a data center. Yeah. I'll rent space. I'll buy a service. And I get the same outcome. Yeah. Oh, I'm outcome focused. Precisely. Right? I don't want to buy products. Right? You want a, you want a steak dinner? Do you yeah. want to go to the grocery store, fill up your cart with all the stuff, mm -hmm. go home, and then fix dinner? And spend hours on the grill. Spend and, hours. Yep. And you may not be good at it, right? You burn True. them. You, you mail it. Raw. Well, you can go to DoorDash, yeah. and you can order in from your favorite restaurant. But then you got to heat it up because it's going to show up cold. Oh, yeah. if it, and if it doesn't show up right, you got to still. Right? Yeah. Or you can just say, hey, I want a steak dinner. Yep. Give me a steak dinner now. Exactly. Right. And that's basically what an MSP does. Yep. They figure out all of the intricacies of making stuff work together, mm -hmm. figuring out the licensing agreements and the maintenance agreements oh, yeah. and, and, you know, the bits and bytes and the plugging of cables. And mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Right. Just. Give me backup as a service. Give me exactly. Oracle as a service, right? Mm -hmm. I can access, you know, a URL. There's my data. I yep. got my app. I can, it runs 24 hours a day, no matter where I'm at. Mm -hmm. You know, if this state slides into the ocean or this one gets, you know, emerged in a flood, yep. I can stand it up and run it, you know, in the desert. Exactly. And I still have access to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was where the managed service uh, market went. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Pure did a, a really nice job of building out that business and, and integrating that into their channel model. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've got, you know, thousands of very satisfied customers oh, yeah. that are buying it now. Um, the service providers have actually progressed. Mm -hmm. They're not buying the components, mm -hmm. right, and building it themselves. They're buying the software as a service. 
So they don't have to take title to the software or the hardware, right? They just write a check every month and they get all the benefits. So they're getting the outcome. Win win. And then they bundle that with other stuff and sell that outcome to the customer. Mm -hmm. So it's very, um, it's very positive in seeing how these things have progressed and and where they're going to end up. You know, I mean, at some point, right? I I think a lot of the branding will go away. Mm -hmm. You know that we see today in all the different corporations and. And you're going to buy everything from Microsoft. You're going to buy everything from Google. You're going to buy everything from Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. And it's all delivered under their banner. And everything else is an OEM, right, to them. And let them figure it out for you. It's going to have a big impact, I think, on the channel. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, if you look at the definition of channel, right, (laughs) it's a narrow pathway from point A to point B, Mm -hmm. right? An, An ecosystem is a much broader, you know, living organism Mm -hmm. that incorporates all that stuff. So I think the channel Mm -hmm. has migrated to an ecosystem, and I think we're going to see that become more of a a, a major way that customers get to their outcomes. I agree. They want, I think people want uh, fewer, easier, faster choices. Yep. You know? Convenience Uh, is key. Convenience is the key, and it allows them to focus on what they really are trying to accomplish. Exactly. Building airplanes or making ice cream or selling yeah. shoes or selling books, right? Exactly. You know, I mean, Beatles had the idea of selling books online. Nobody thought that was going to work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I go to Barnes and Noble. I don't need to buy them. Exactly. You know, have them shipped to me. That doesn't make any Why sense. Why about that on the internet? That's stupid. Why, yeah. I got, yeah, I got books. I got, uh, what was it? I got Borders books right down the street. Yeah. They're awesome. Yeah, I got everything. Awesome. Yeah. But I don't have room yeah. for all these books. So put it on a tablet, right? Yeah. Oh, wait, now things are digital. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I got all this excess capacity because I build computer systems to meet my demands at the peak buying times, right? Mm. Christmas, you know, Mother's Day, things like that. Black Friday, yep. What am I going to do with all that excess capacity? Exactly. Oh, remember Ross Perot when he had EDS? What he did with it? He sold it to his customers as a service. And that's all Jeff Bezos did, you know, that's all they did when they created Amazon Web Services. Oh, that's right. It's it's the systems that run their business Hmm. that are now being sold to other businesses. I'm, absolutely. I'm actually surprised at Amazon scale. Why don't they why don't they just make their own laptops? Not just to save just not, not just to save the employee cost cuz you're buying an employee laptop, but that would probably break even just with the volume, but then you could sell that another thing you could sell to clients. I'm well, actually surprised they don't do that yet. Yeah. You know, they tried phones. Oh yeah, that's true. A couple years back. You know. Yeah. Um that's so I hard think, to break into cuz yeah, Am, I mean Amazon and Samsung are pretty locked in to yeah, the market. I yeah. mean, and everybody wanted an iPhone because it was easy. Oh, uh, it's very true. You know, anything yeah. that's not on the Apple platform was considered not easy. Yeah. Android has done a pretty good job of coming back to that, but, mm. you know, it's back and forth. <clears throat> There's no third choice, right? There was a Microsoft mm. phone for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't buy one of those, but I tried it. Very few did. You had, so, Bla- you had BlackBerry. Now they're just <laughs> sad. They're just software now. Yeah. For like 18 customers. Kidding. I love you, BlackBerry. Yeah. <laughs> I loved my BlackBerry when it first came out. What oh, yeah. A, what a revolutionary tool. Most secure platform, bar none. Yeah. And you could you could walk oh, yeah. and send emails, right? Yeah. Can't tell you how many times I almost got hit by a car, <laughs> you know, going through an intersection. There, there's a reason I, they call them crackberries. I mean, yeah. Mike, Mike Lazarius was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still, I mean, you know, I go to restaurants now, I see couples... You know, with their kids, they're mm. all looking at their phone. They're oh, yeah. not talking to each other. No. You know, they're not enjoying the environment. They're just. Mm. Oh, it's that's probably one of the most brilliant things telecom companies did was subsidize cell phones. So when the smartphones came out, you you're paying for it in the long term, but they get they, you know, they gave they, it away at free. Then you had to buy the data plan. Right. And now you do have to buy a smartphone and no one's going to go. Very few are actually going to go back. So and where do they make the money? Exactly. On month, the data. plan. Month. Yep. Month to so, month. Well, back in time, yeah. right? it's all about data. Exactly. It's all about the data. How you how you create it, content creators like yourself. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right? What would you say, 570 gigs? Uh, a one-hour interview is 756 gigs, and it just exponentially grows from there if it's in raw form before we actually yeah, render it. render it. Just mm-hmm. throw an intro and outro in it. It's, yeah, I didn't realize how much data this When I was building out this whole setup, we did like a run. You did a practice run. You're like, oh, I'll probably just edit it on my laptop. Nope. <laughs> yeah. You had to build I can't a computer e- for it. I can't even keep up with the statistics, but it's something like we create more data a day in a 24-hour period mm. than we did in a year 10 years ago. Well, I believe it. You know, and it's only getting worse because 
more and more people are creating content. Yep. Younger and younger people are creating content. Mm -hmm. Platforms are creating massive amounts of content. Oh yeah. You know, all of the social media platforms, all of the AI platforms. I mean, AI is the next iteration. That's right? true. And what does AI do? It analyzes and consolidates data mm -hmm. to provide an outcome to you that you can now program and ask yourself instead of going, you know, to some massive, uh, you know, platform that you have to figure out how to use it. You mm -hmm. just use, ask it a question. Exactly. And what are your thoughts on all these companies making their own AI chips? Because it, it was just NVIDIA. Now you got every major company. So you got Google, you got Meta. They're all going to make their own in-house AI chip sets. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing like PCs, yeah. right? I remember when, you know, everybody made hard drives, right? Yeah. They were 10 or 15 different hard drive manufacturers. Really? Yeah. That didn't last. It's like three right? now. <laughs> or maybe two. Maybe three, right? Yeah. yeah. It, same with SSDs. There's three or four you know that are good ones there's a bunch yeah. of crap on the market of, of course. course but wish, yeah wish. I mean, everybody's, <laughs> everybody's gonna go chase the next thing yeah. right so yeah you got 10 chip manufacturers trying to create you know, the next fastest speediest ai chip hmm. that's going to consolidate customers are going to make a choice one way or the other true. it'll come down to two or three it always does true you know uh, every industry goes through that rapid expansion and consolidation. Oh, yeah. um, Just like the car, I mean, automotive company, 100 years ago, there was over 135 car companies in the U.S. Yeah. And now there's like three or four, depending on how you define U.S. company for automotive. Yeah. <laughs> Our, yeah. Ford and GM are the only, I think. Uh, still, yeah, because Stellantis, you know, Chrysler. It's, Chrysler's not U.S. based anymore. No. I mean, they're owned by an international company. Yeah. But that's okay. You got Tesla. You know, you got Tesla. Rivian right? might make it this year. We'll see. They're, they got some financial issues. They got a really cool product. I saw one in the store yesterday. They got cool products. But guess yeah. what? Cool products don't always win. No. <laughs> that, that's very true. Some of the best products to be like, oh, that's great. But how many units are you selling? Because right now they're losing $43,500 43, per vehicle. That's not sustainable. No. Now, Lucid is lucky, though, because guess who's the biggest investor in Lucid? I don't know. Was it the pension fund of Saudi Arabia? Oh, okay. So they've got pockets to... Unlimited yeah. money then, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, until, you know, we get off of fossil fuels, which I don't believe will happen in either one of our lifetimes. No. Uh, or even our lifetimes combined, no. right? I don't think that's going to happen. Well, we the need... infrastructure's not there. Oh, no, that's the like, scary thing about laws being passed that are taking extra what it, the ripple effect into it, the ripple effect into effect yeah. it sounds grammatically wrong or awkward but or cumbersome but like i know california wants to make gas cars illegal by 2035 but their current infrastructure cannot support their current energy demand so they either need to go nuclear and even then there's not enough lithium so really going back to technology that's why a lot of these companies put so much research development to what's the next battery tech we've been using lithium batteries for a couple of decades now it's yeah. run its course is it going to be graphene? Is it going to be a new... Is, is something that's going to change IT and everything is to, you can actually hold back and then make it reliable. Yeah. Like my car will last a million miles in about 20 years because it's a Honda Civic with an internal combustion <laughs> engine and three pedals is all cars should have by default, but <laughs> it's longevity. Yeah. The batteries, just by the very nature, they're disposable five to seven years. They're getting better, but that's the bottleneck in the transition, I think, for the automotive communities. How do we make the energy and how do you make it long-term reliable for actual batteries too? Yeah. We haven't figured out a way to recycle, right? Yeah, Diesel yeah. batteries. Well, no, yeah, no one thinks right? about that though. What are we? What are we going <laughs> to do with, you know, a mountain of used lithium? Oh, there's like there's one. Oh, I forget the name. It loses me at the moment. There's one company in the U.S. trying to go for it, but yeah, the nice thing about lead acid batteries is they're pretty much infinitely recyclable. I mean, that hence interstate batteries. That's a big part That's of what they their do. Business, right. But lithium ion is like you can recycle a whole data center, and the most expensive thing to recycle will be the box of cell phones there. Yeah. Because it's so volatile and. I think Mercedes is the only company fully dedicated to having a full life cycle management. So they are building a structure in Germany, I believe, in Europe, obviously Europe, where after the EVs dies, they will take that back and they'll actually recycle everything. Granted, you can't you know get everything back. back yeah. And I'm not how sure, I, don't, I don't know how much money they're losing on that, but very few companies are well, thinking of those other variables how to recycle this stuff. I just read an article that said that the uh, the Mercedes flagship electric car the eos oh yeah i saw right? that yeah right? more than 50 percent depreciation <laughs> in 18 months okay so yeah. i'm gonna give you a hundred thousand dollars yeah i can get maybe fifty thousand dollars if i can sell it yeah right <laughs> uh and then i don't know what the next guy is gonna get garbage garbage i mean right? it's, it's gonna be free 
Yeah. You know, because you're going to have to buy a new battery for it. Good luck. Yeah, exactly. So that's another big issue is depreciation. So I always tell people, like, there are some companies like Hyundai's, I'm pretty sure they're losing money because one of my friends just rented the Iconic 5 or Icon 5, whatever they call it. It was a fun car. And if you're leasing an EV for the individual, then it could make fiscal sense. Yeah. But again, like my uh, my family, I don't know. I, I need to invest in Honda. I don't know how I'm not a shareholder yet, but like <laughs> they bought a 2001 Honda Accord. Good old fashioned trunk combustion engine, four cylinders of greatness. It'll run for another 10 years. It's still running in yeah. the Midwest. Yeah. It's beating salt. And it still runs. Mm, yeah. And again, we don't have that. And I don't know if it's possible to get that because again, with more electronics, more you always introduce more variables, more failure points. Do you think we'll get to the point where EVs are reliable in our lifetime? I don't. I, they're not re reliable today. Oh, well, no, I know, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, so, you, you know, we're going to invest a ton of money. Oh, yeah. Right? And the government's going to subsidize a ton of money. $7,500 per vehicle, I think, is what yeah. it is. And we're going to end up with uh, a bunch of tin cans sitting on the side of the road someplace that nobody can use. I wish they were, I wish they were as durable as tin. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the other issue is a lot of con big contributing factor is will we be allowed to buy a nice car in five years, ten years? You have states banning them, and then the U.S., the EPA, we'll see if this is challenged again. People always say you might not care about politics, but politics is very much cares about you and your business because one of the reasons these companies are moving towards EVs is because the EPA has increased the tailpipe standards or the emission fleet standards to a point in which the only way you can conceivably comply is by increasing the output of your EV manufacturing capabilities. Yeah. So as a company, you have to have a certain amount of standards. That's why a lot of them are also making EVs. They're being incentivized in that regard. In that case, poke, well, poking with a stick in a negative incentive. But so. we're, we're incentivizing the consumption device. Mm. We're not subsidizing the utilities to create the energy that will power those devices. And people are too scared of nuclear. I blame the Simpsons. As funny as that it's might sound, because, yeah. again, it made it... There have been... And obviously, when there's an issue, it's detrimental. It's, but statistically speaking, it's one of the... Safest. Is currently the safest, most efficient form of energy, bar none. I mean... Yeah. The ROI for a, I did, I was so went down the rabbit hole in college writing papers about the ROI of like green, quote unquote green energy, because it's not fiscally green and in some cases it's not great for the environment. But the ROI for some of these windmills is 20 plus years and the blades are not good for the environment. They're, spoiler alert. They're damaging, yeah. Yeah. And so again, uh, it's one of those things, just like an IT, there's not just things one solution that'll fit everything. Like, just make, have, just make sense to have solar in California. Probably it's, it's darn near perfect most of the year. Yeah. That you actually, you have a compelling reason where it would make sense. Does that work in Connecticut? I mean, no. Probably not. Yeah. It doesn't work in Texas. No. You know, I just drove to West Texas last weekend. Yeah. Right? And once you hit Abilene, mm -hmm. you know, there's massive wind farms. Oh, yeah. Less than half of them were spinning. But it's good marketing. They were 25, 30 mile an hour winds. Yeah. Right? Sustainable. Mm -hmm. It added an hour to my drive. Yeah. Right? The wind turbines aren't turning. <laughs> so they're not generating electricity. No. That doesn't make sense to me. If there's wind blowing, they should be they should be generating electricity. Exactly. Lower my electric bill. Yeah. You know. And if, that, you, if you can't consume it, don't make it. But yeah. there's consumers for electricity, well, everywhere. You know, it's. I, if you could make it again, Kevin O'Leary O'Leary is one of the few Shark Tanks that's more bombastic about you know talking about the gritty details of what will and won't work. And he continually says, and it's true, green energy will be green and be adopted by everyone the minute it can be profitable. Because then every private sector business will invest yeah. and every consumer, like if I could, if my electric bill could be completely wiped out by just having solar panels in the house, even though I'm renting, I would do that immediately. Yeah. If you could get an ROI in like two to three months, that's a, that's a no brainer. If you could get it in two or three years, yeah, you but, know, it's, it would be doable, but it's uh, not. Yeah. yeah and and it, it's a great marketing campaign. Very true. Right. And the yeah. government wasted a lot of money in subsidizing it. And oh, like cylinder no batteries. No, you remember that? <laughs> We won't mention any names. But. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> so. But yeah, I'll be interested. And I don't know. I'm old fashioned. I, I would only ever buy something with three pedals because I love it so much. And I, <laughs> I know that's definitely the minority of the consumer preferences these days in the yeah. United States. Well, they just they want to take it away from you. They want to take you out of control completely. Oh, yeah. Well, Self driving cars. So I can't believe Ford actually. So Ford patented this. Then they actually let it. They just let it go. So Ford patented the idea of being able to disable your car by features, not just like. Hey, you're buying your payment. We're going to shut down the car. Well, you're buying your payment. We're going to turn off your AC. So they patented that. The U.S. government, the officially, they stamped the patent. Ah. They said, oh, yeah, it's good. And then I think they got so much negative press. Ford's right. like, all right, we're going to let uh, this go yeah, away. Yeah. But that's our issue when it comes to EVs is the IT security. If it's electronic, it can be hacked. Yeah, and, and has been. Yes. I mean, 
it is rudimentary as a Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee. Wired.com famously, or Wired, whatever magazine, a couple years ago, they famously had someone on the highway in the Jeep. They hacked in. They were able to take the full control, took it over. Mm-hmm. They actually moved lanes, went to the side of the road. And shut it down. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that's my other big concern is not just privacy, but also you know security Physical and safety. Physical security. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, everything that we thought was sci-fi, you know, 5, 10, 15, 75, 100 years ago. Yeah. It's all come true. True. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? 110%. Uh, yeah. And and we need some more forward thinkers thinking of the next thing that we can come up with. Oh, yeah. Right? So we can stop worrying about the effects of AI on jobs and, and all of that. Right? AI is going to create more jobs than it takes. Oh, yeah. Right? Because there's still people have to uh, think of the next idea. AI mm-hmm. can't think. You can process information. Well, right? you think it'll live, eventually become sentient in our lifetime? That's the other big debate in AI and... What will it, could it get to that point? I, what I've learned in my life, mm-hmm. anything's possible. True. Anything is possible. If somebody has the conviction and the desire and mm-hmm. the determination to make it happen, mm-hmm. they'll make it happen. Hence Elon. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I've never, I don't know, you know me, I love my gas car. I've never buy a Tesla, but I mean, his business acumen is bar none. I, I'm impressed with what, he, what he's done. It's I would incredible. never, I would never own a Tesla, yeah. but I would lease a Tesla. Exactly, right? Because yeah. all I want is the outcome. Precisely, yeah. You know, actually yeah. going to zero. It's got that's again. The EVs have changed everything. Automotive it is interesting. When I was a kid, the coolest thing was what car has the most horsepower in zero to sixty. Now every EV is a supercar because by just by the inherent nature of the technology, they can go to zero to sixty under two seconds. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. It's blistering fast. We haven't evolved to the point where we can actually. Handle that kind Not of yet. acceleration. We'll get the ro- we'll get the robotics and neural link <laughs> well, inside I'll of us. Well, get a chip implant, you know, yeah. and then I can directly control it, and maybe I'll be in charge. Well, those are they're already entering human trials. They're working. I know, I know. I haven't signed up, but I know about it. That'll be interesting. Do you th- would you adopt one or get the neural link implant in your lifetime? Or? Uh, you know, it, I might. Yeah, I might. I, I like the concept. Mm-hmm. You know, I like being. You know, I hate typing, oh, yeah. right? I don't, I mean, if I could instantly connect to the internet and use AI to query things and get mm-hmm. information and, and use that in my daily life, yeah, I'd do that in a heartbeat. It's, it has the biggest gap in the technologies, humans be able to communicate with computers, like to type something. Well, Lord knows I have a lot of typos, just look at my LinkedIn, no matter how hard, <laughs> no matter how hard I try, dyslexia, I don't know what it is. Yeah. But, and LinkedIn also doesn't have spell check. Come on, Microsoft, you're a multi-trillion dollar company. But. Mean, come on, <laughs> yeah. Well, first you have to go and do it in Word and then uh, run it through chat GPT to yeah. reformat the language and check all the yeah. pronunciation and, and the spelling. And then you can post it yeah. into LinkedIn. There's okay. got to be a faster way. Kind of talk about sci-fi and technology. I think the only thing the Matrix got wrong was they had the idea that humans were forced to enter it. People were going to willingly go into the Matrix. Yeah. I mean, like the, like the neural chip or the neural link with that chip. Let's say... It gets to the price point where, you know, it's pretty affordable, relatively speaking. If every one of your competitors, whether you're sales, engineering, math, science, whatever your job is, but if every one of your competitors has it, and you don't, you can, they're going to be running laps around you. They'll be able to computate things faster than you can blink. Yeah. So you're going to be out. Your well, business will be gone if you don't. And what if your customer has it and you don't? Exactly. Even worse. They'll look at you like you're a primate. Like you can't comprehend they're on a whole other level. Right. You're no longer competitive or, or offering any value. Exactly. And uh, I hope I never see that day. Right. <laughs> then what happens if you download a virus or something? How that, how's that work? <laughs> I was going to make a COVID joke, but no, I'll stay away from no, no, no. it. Well, YouTube changed the rules. Well, YouTube's like, well, I don't know who's more. Well, uh, YouTube changes the rules all the time, but apparently you don't get banned for saying that magical word anymore. So whatever you want to say, go for yeah. it. Man. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> No, I'll, no, no, you're good, you're good. I'll, I'll keep going. So, all right, so you know what the difference is between Wuhan and Vegas? What? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Put them on the map, though. Yeah. Everyone well, knows about that now. Everybody knows where what it is. They don't know where it is, but... Well, that's, that is true, actually, yeah. They know, they know what they're known for now, the lab. <laughs> the labs, yeah. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see if we get to the point where AI is actually coming up with new prescriptions for us and coming up with... If you actually perfect the human body in terms of making sure it can never get sick. If you have nanobots inside yourself, it'd be interested to see what we see in the regard with technological innovation. Yeah. I mean, that's probably one of the few sci-fi ideas, right? The nanobots in your bloodstream that, yeah. you know, can, can uh, prevent or, you know, anticipate 
viruses, cancers, mm. yeah. you know, things like that. That hasn't come true yet. But I think it's because there's so much money in pharmaceuticals. That's true. You know, I mean, it seems like every day I don't watch a lot of television, but mm. it seems like when I turn the TV on, they're advertising a drug for a disease I've never heard of. That's true. You know, I was like, are you making up the disease yes. to sell the drug? In some cases, yeah. You know, I mean, really, that seems like a maybe, you know, a, a very small percentage of the entire human population has, oh, yeah. you know, worms. Okay, but mm. you're going to market the heck out of a multi-billion oh, yeah. dollar drug, right, to combat worms yep. or whatever they come up with. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know. I don't know. Well, they also expand the definitions of things. I forget the, is it the five, not the 501, is it DSM, DSM-5? It, there's a, the medical, basically their terms and their whole standards, they redefine the term depression or chronic depression. So it's not just if you're sad once. If you're just sad in general, they can give you drugs now. Or they, they say, oh, yeah, you're de- if you're just feeling sad or you have a bad day, you, you qualify for depression. That's my understanding of the situation now, which Great. exponentially increases the sample size of prospective clients. Yeah, well, that's why we need another <laughs> opioid crisis. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> it's like define geez. pain. Oh, it's it's any discomfort. Yep. Right? And we give you a ranking, right, from zero to to ten. Yeah. Uh, well, everyday life puts you at like a three. Yeah. Exactly. Dude, I right? stubbed my toe. <laughs> yeah. I need a drug. Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. And what do you like to do outside of the office? Oh gosh, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm I'm a news junkie. Yeah. Uh, I read. What's your a favorite lot. platform? Or you like I don't have a news? favorite platform. You can't yeah. trust one. It's right? true. You got to look at all of them, oh, right? Yeah. So I, I use a lot of aggregation points. I try and see both sides to every argument. That's what I right? do. It. Get a lot of information and then make my own decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I read a book a day. A book um, a day? Yeah. Oh my gosh, what, what kind of books are you reading? That's incredible. A little bit of everything: business, uh, history, uh, fiction, nonfiction, That's autobiographies. Um, What's your favorite book of the year thus far? If you had to pick one, uh, there's a I, I can't remember the exact title. It's Closing the Loop or something like that. It's about the uh, subprime housing market crash. Oh, really? But it's told from the perspective of the three individuals who led the uh, the whole pushback against the mortgage companies. Really? The three individuals that that took it upon themselves. Mm-hmm. to popularize the information, to make it public, mm-hmm. and to go after the companies that were, you know, basically bankrupted millions of people in this country. Yeah. And uh, it's a fascinating book because it's about people. Yeah. You know, I don't like reading about ideas because I everybody's got an idea. True. What do you, it's what you do with it. Oh, yeah. Right? So that's why I like biographies. I want to know about the people, mm-hmm. you know, that changed the world or had an impact in the world. And these three people, one of them was a nurse. Oh, really? Got herself into a situation where she had a condo and she got married, she bought a house, mm-hmm. and she had, you know, ridiculous interest rates on both of them. She ended up losing both of them. Oh shit! Really? You know, cost her her marriage, yeah. cost her both her properties, put her in bankruptcy, you know, and and she actually got to the point where she stopped working. Really? You know, because she was so depressed about Jesus. the financial situation that they put her in. So that's one of my favorite books this year. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's very interesting. And, you know, then. I mean, it's, I see something and I see a little blurb or I read the last three sentences of the, mm. of the book and go, okay, I want to know how they got there. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, there's a book about uh, Oliver Cromwell that I just finished called The mm. Wolf. It was really, really good. Most people don't know who Oliver Cromwell was, which is a sad situation because he was a, a major influence in Restoration England, mm. right? And really, you know, was responsible for the separation of church and state really? in England. Um, because he he backed the policy right of the mm. the Protestants versus the Catholics and mm. separating the Catholic Church out of out of the running of the country. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm old school. I like history. I need to check that out. I love history books. That this year, this far this year, I've read the uh, ones well, biographies, biographies or books about them. So sometimes they're not written by the actual you know, person. But uh, this year, I read about Henry Ford, the Dodge brothers, and Honda or Sochiro uh, Honda, the founder. Yeah, and they're fascinating. Yeah, it's a great story. They the History Channel did. Oh yeah, uh, they used to be great. Them. Now they yeah. talk about aliens. I mean, yeah. back when I was a kid, they actually talked about <laughs> cool things like weird cool weapons. Things. Yeah. yeah, yeah, real things that happen, not speculative stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Ancient civilizations, you know, beaming thought power, you know, yeah. thoughts across the globe, all that stuff. Oh, that, I used to yeah. love History Channel growing up. I remember one of my favorite. I think they put it on YouTube eventually. But it was like they had the weird weapons of the Allies and weird weapons of the Axis. Where yeah. 
they get some of these some of them just made the prototypes but the most bizarre creative weapons like they had the pigeon bomb mm -hmm. where's a bomb that was guided by a pigeon poking on a screen i kid you not <laughs> yeah as a real thing the real thing yeah well i mean guy Ritchie just came out with a, a movie mm -hmm. right uh, uh ungentlemanly warfare or something mm -hmm. it's about the first special forces operation on the planet back during mm -hmm. world war ii and it was all about these mad scientists in england who were coming up with things like that yeah and then these guys went out in the field and did it Right? Oh, really? Field trials. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, they, they romanticized it. Of course. Know, yeah, it, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, history reminds us, right, of, mm. of what's possible mm. and what to avoid. True. And that's why I like reading about it. It is kind of funny, too. People think controversies are new or they think, you know, like, oh, my gosh, this person's buying a media outlet. It's like, that's not new. It's like, people are freaking out, like, oh, my gosh, Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post. Elon Musk bought Twitter. It's like, well... Yeah, riding back the clock a couple of years, Ford did the same thing. Ford bought his own newspaper, he bought his own magazine, they distribute them or sell them at the dealerships. I mean, yeah. a lot of these concepts and ideas and these situations just tend to keep repeating themselves. Anytime you get two people together, you get a conspiracy coming someplace. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> they're not, they're not going to agree on everything, and one of them is going to be paranoid. Yeah, so, very true. You know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> You like to hit the track a little bit more these days? Or? I haven't. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I've been doing a lot of road trips, so I get my, oh, really? I get my uh, driving satisfaction in. There you uh, go. I tell you, it's kind of dangerous, you know, these express lanes. Uh, yeah. uh, well, you know, the posted speed limit is 75. Oh, that's, about, okay. that's about the exit speed yeah, that I, I see say. most people taking. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm going 75, 80, 85. People are passing me like I'm standing still. Oh, yeah. So then I have to keep up. Well, then the next thing you know, we're in triple digits, you yeah. know, and that, that's just not safe. Well, I mean, I would debate. I mean, with modern cars, I don't know. This, I'm surprised speed limits, well, my conspiracy or my theory is they don't increase speed limits to keep ticket rates up so you can make money. But every year, cars get faster and safer, and yet the speed limits have been the, the same, same for decades in many cases. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, 100 miles per hour is not fast for, like, a Corolla will do that. Like, right. Every, Pretty much every modern production vehicle will hit 100 without stressing, stressing. the engine too much. Yeah. And I guess the only detriment would be don't text and drive, obviously, in that case. But for the most part, I think people, do you think I react? I wonder, that'd be a fascinating topic in and of itself. Our reaction times, are they the same or maybe arguably better because we study and we use technology daily basis? I mean, I wonder if drivers, uh, we need to get an insurance company here. I mean, drivers, I would argue, maybe got better or the same. So why couldn't they go faster? Are we educating drivers enough oh, that's to true drive too. that fast, right? I, yeah. I have friends who have 16-year-olds that are learning how to drive, Yeah. right? They have no concept what they're doing. Oh, they have yeah. no concept of, of how much destructive impact they could cause oh, yeah. with that vehicle, right? And they're all texting or playing with the radio or oh, doing geez. Spotify or yeah. filming themselves driving. Oh, I'm like, you know, put the phone. Why isn't there a chip in every, manu in every vehicle that's been mm -hmm. manufactured in the last 25 years? That when you get in the car, it turns your phone off. I mean, if you're a hacker, you do an art, uh, you jam the signal. I don't recommend it because it's illegal. Right. But <laughs> yeah. how, how many accidents and, and deaths would that solve? Right. Mm. And I mean, it's intrusive. Yeah. People would throw a fit if you did that. Yeah. But you you really want to drive vehicle safety? Mm. Turn it off. Oh yeah. Turn it off. Well, Radios are, are are just as distracting. But oh yeah. They've gotten to the point where they're you know people are used to that at least. Oh, yeah. But you give them a camera and a and a device to communicate. Social media. Social media. They're gonna do yeah. that, you know. So. And also, a couple of companies. You know, every a lot of companies in the automotive community thought we're spending millions of dollars in research and development to make our own, you know, CarPlay technology or whatever. Then the other one's like, let's just mirror your smartphone and save a lot of money because people are already used to the smartphones. Yeah. Why? Again, what outcome are you trying to get to? Yeah. And it, right. And those. I want access to my content. Oh. Yep. Okay. Right? Use the, the methodologies that are available. Your car already has a radio. Yeah. Right? Add some software to it. Boom. You got it. Exactly. Right? Don't try and, you know, make individual interfaces. Yeah. The age old saying for the cars is like, if you need a cup holder or a phone adapter, you're not, you didn't buy the right car. <laughs> <laughs> if you're texting and driving, like, get, yeah. get some more exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just watched the Ferrari movie on Netflix. The oh, other really? Day. How was it? It was awesome. But, uh, you know, one of the world's famous. Uh, race car drivers is, you know, interviewing to, to drive. Ferrari wants him to drive, mm -hmm. you know, for him. He's like, this car has no ashtray. <laughs> yeah. you know, that was a must have for him. Really? Right? I'm not driving this Ferrari yeah. sports car in a race yeah. if there's no ashtray in the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that was that's you know that's specificity right yeah. there you know and uh, how times have changed now they even called a cigarette adapter or cigarette lighter and no. they call it like a power adapter power for adapter. the little yeah. socket you yeah. plug your speed detector in smoking's bad for you yeah who says that yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i remember you know back in my day everyone had a little now they call it like the meme is like what is this it's a learning experience the thing where you pushed it in and it became a hot yeah. coil so you could light a cigarette for yeah. i think that was in every car when i was a kid growing up when grandpa had that i mean it's a fun learning experience. It was. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. like, why is this getting glowing red? Touch it. Well, touch it. Oh, yeah, don't touch that. Yeah, they don't touch have it. To be told why? Once. Yeah. You'll, they'll touch it once. Yeah. <laughs> then they'll learn. Everybody touched it once. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Just like the stove theory. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, once. Yeah. But yeah, it's, yeah, automotive, it's all changing quickly. It'll be interesting to see. If you, had, if you can buy any track toy, you wouldn't lie tomorrow, what kind of car would you get? An Aston Martin Vantage. That's my dream car. Nice. Yeah. Dark green with a, you know, a black interior. I'm not a big tan interior guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Aston Martin Vantage would be my, my dream car. I was going to say, how much of that brand value is attributed to James Bond? It, oh, 100%. Is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, who heard of Aston Martin before James Bond, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and who's kept the brand alive over the last, you know, 50 years? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, you don't, I don't even know if there's an Aston Martin dealer. In Fort Worth, there's one in there has I there's one in Dallas, yeah. but I don't. I mean, you know, I I haven't seen an Aston Martin in probably a year. Right? Yeah, but yeah, in way back in the back of my brain, I want to be James Bond. I they're, want to drive an Aston Martin. They're one of the coolest. And again, hand built, good old English engineering, and they still have a stick shift too, which is yes. even rare. I mean, Three pedals. I mean, how many V12 stick shifts are there? I guess the new DB12 is going to have a V8 for some. Bastardized reasons for the French emissions or yeah weight you know I'm sure the government regulated oh, something oh yeah. well, no yeah. that's yeah that's one of the reasons manuals are also dying is it's not as fuel efficient it's been that way for like thirty years now yeah but yeah the, to me the Aston's one of the coolest and again they're so tempting because you can get like a nice used Aston Martin well I say not nice you can get a used Aston Martin with a stick shift and you know V8 or bigger for about you know thirty to forty grand however yeah. maintenance and maintenance the repairs yeah and especially the well. Uh, I was going to say, it's so sad. Not really. The automatic transmissions basically grenade themselves. But to Aston Martin's credit, if you pay for it, you can actually send it back to England, and they'll actually do the manual swap for you at the factory. Nice. It's really, that's exceptional customer service. Like, that's really cool. Like, in my dream garage, if I I had unlimited funds, I would definitely love to get one of those. Because, again, you have V12. Like, I forget the send-off version, but, like, the last, I forget the last one with the V12, and the stick shift, they went all out. And, of course, they're worth more than a couple houses. Sure. But every component is just so beautifully engineered. The materials are amazing. Yeah. I mean, they just do it right. Yeah. And they, the CEO just last, uh, just recently said, "We, you know what? We said we're going to go EV. We're going to be dedicated to the gas engine as long as possible, which, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> would, you want a, would you want an electric Aston Martin? No. It, it was one of those things where I always tell people, if you want an EV, sports car, whatever, that's cool. I would say make a new car. And I, under, I understand brands have to adapt and improve over time, but when it comes to sports cars and luxury cars, I would also argue a lot of those folks like longevity, like a Rolls Royce. Now, the interesting thing with Rolls Royce is they'll last hundreds of years if you properly maintain them. Yeah. And, I mean, you used to have airplane engines. It's really cool. I mean, nowadays it's a separate legal entity, fun fact. <laughs> but, again, Rolls Royce also a really big thing about that is quietness, and that's where EVs are there. But... Even they are kind of precarious. Depending on what leader you ask at the company, they kind of go back and <laughs> forth. So I can understand it. But yeah, like I know GM makes a Corvette as a hybrid and EV now. And to me, a Corvette will always have a stick shift and a V8. Yeah, should. Yeah. But yeah. You shouldn't have a mid engine. Yeah, that's a, contra- <laughs> that's a controversy in and of itself. I remember Neil Zor- I mean, Zorro, the founder, or not basically the brainchild that yeah. saved the Corvette. Because they came out in 53, kind of tumbled down, wasn't really doing well sales. But yeah, mid-engine was controversial. Then they killed the stick shift. So GM has two cars with stick shift now. It's a Cadillac CTS4, uh, CTS V4 or CT4, and the CT5. They still have stick shifts. Those are all. That's it. That's it. Is no one of my friends let me drove the CT uh, CT4 V Blackwing. Oh yeah. It, that's a fifty percent take rate for the stick shift. It's the best thing GM's made in probably ten plus years. I mean, it felt amazing. I mean, the transmission is perfect. Exhaust note is beautiful. Twin, twin turbo V6. Did they sell any of them? Yeah, no, pretty good amount. I really? think 
yeah, and I think for that demographic of who they're trying to sell towards, it's going to be, they'll try to keep that alive. I mean, Mary Barrow said, or CEO Jim Rose said, they want to have Cadillac by EV 100% by 2030, full General Motors portfolio by 2035, which, again, they missed the mark. They said like, they have one hybrid right now. It's the Corvette. The biggest growing category in the model development community in the United that's States is only, hybrids. That's the only hybrid they have? Yes. I don't follow American cars, so. Very few do. It's, yeah. Yeah, they've, they've fallen a long way. But like, yeah, that, the biggest growing category for what consumers want is hybrids. And, yeah. They wow. make one. It's a Corvette. I was like, Crazy. missing the mark, <laughs> folks. What are you doing? But yeah, an Aston Martin would be so much, fun. especially going to the track with all those things. Oh, my gosh. That would be a dream come true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, America doesn't really have uh, the roadways to take advantage of a vehicle like that, you know. We have an interstate highway system that was designed to land airplanes on, yeah. right? In case we've had war with Russia, so mm -hmm. you know, big long straightaways. That car needs curves yeah, and, true. and hills, and you know, you could probably do it in the hill country. Well, um, I was gonna say when when you win the lottery, you're gonna have to come to the track with me, and join NASA sometime. <laughs> you got some fun curves in there, and got yeah. a couple hills. Yeah, I, I might <laughs> take you up on that. that Absolutely. Like fun. Well, Paul, thanks so much for having yeah, the show. Appreciate you, man. I appreciate it. Had a great time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to tune in. Don't forget, we are also on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. Also, don't forget to take the time to like, subscribe, and comment. And lastly, don't forget to take the time to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone. Just stay safe and have a great day. <laughs>